Um, also, just on a kind of housekeeping note, if um, if you're not getting emails, um, you know, kind of notifying you of things, um, that means you're probably not on the, the distribution list. So if you could maybe connect with Cub, um, and uh, we'd love to get you on there. Uh, no desire on our part to withhold information. We just got to maintain accurate lists. So if you're not getting things, um, please uh, let us know that so that we can we can let you know um, when we have announcements to make. And that's a tool we use for communication with prayer concerns as well. Lots of prayer concerns this week uh, that we had. So we come to the Lord and we worship Him. This is all about what Jesus has done for us. And uh, we, uh, we just marvel at his mercy and his grace. And it's our privilege to, to uh, just take in, to survey all that God's done for us. So let's, let's uh, take in the wonder of the cross as we worship together. All right. Well, I wanted to um, let's turn this on. There we go. Uh, there we go. Okay. Well, first things first, let's just get this out of the way. Uh, and uh, not everyone has gotten the email, so I'm just going to kind of just touch on this. I think maybe this isn't for you, this is for me, because I think as a, as a pastor, there's some pretty clear passages, <laughs> especially Old Testament, talks about this, talks about God's shepherds. He said, you worthless shepherds. You didn't warn when I told you to warn. Ezekiel's pretty clear, too, that if you're watching on the walls and you see something, you don't say anything, it's on you. If you say something, it's not on you. So... Romans 13, 1 to 2 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. It means really all authority is delegated authority from God. And, and, uh, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed and will incur judgment. So it's that last piece that has me doing this. I think we are part of the everyone. When it says everyone, we're, we're, we're in that. Uh, the four is a ground uh, that says our obedience is really to God ultimately. So uh, that when we ignore God's delegated authority, we ignore God's authority. And, uh, and that's why he ends up saying um, that, that there's judgment. And that's the reason why I wanted to say something. I don't like talking about this. I don't like this thing. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather just go away. Uh, but um, there's that piece, that last piece, just saying that those that disregard the authorities that, that God put in place disregard God. How you treat God's delegated authority is how you treat Him. Um, and uh, I think of Jesus' words in His trial, when He says that to Pilate, that you have no authority whatsoever except for that which God has given you. Uh, that if Jesus can submit to evil, sinful leaders in His unjust, illegal trial, uh, what He's asking us to do here, I don't think, is, is incredible. Um, and so it's those things that... Hear, hear my heart. I want you to hear my heart on this. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this and watch this thing kind of, kind of, you know, like the King Wednesday, and, and we're just trying to figure out how to do this. I know a lot of churches are scrambling on this one, too. We're going to continue to dialogue with those in the body. Not everyone is... I don't think anyone's real happy about this, uh, but some are struggling more than others. Uh, please hear my heart. Unity is so important. So important. And this last point, let's not let this play a, a larger role than it should. Because I think, I think if, uh, if we end up pulling the car over to have it out over this, I think in the end of the day, I want to ask you, who's, who's winning there? Is that God? Is God getting the win or is the enemy getting the win? Um, and, and I think if, if we pull it over, and I, I, had, I talked to some pastors that said they could see some churches splitting over this. And I just thought, that's not God's... That's not God's plan. You know, he didn't bring a church into existence to say, let's have that thing split over masks. Um, I think that that's the enemy winning. And uh, there are so many exciting things happening. There are so many cool things that God is doing in our midst. And uh, I, I would really hate to see this thing play a larger role than it should. Don't want to diminish it. But but sometimes it's, you know, you can get, get your hand clenched on something and and it can take on a larger role than it should. So I just hope that we don't uh, get sidetracked with eternal matters, with things that don't matter at all. Now, in order I should take my own medicine, let's just move on. Okay, so there we go. This is the last sermon in the series in uh, Philippians. And uh, what I want to do next, I feel like God's, uh, God's been 
pushing me to, to preach a book. And I'm just kind of curious. Uh, so I want to preach Jonah next, do a little eight-week series. I'm just curious. Have you? Could you raise your hand if you've heard an entire preaching sermon uh, series on Jonah? Could you, could you raise your hand? We have the... Uh, well, Ron and Cam, I'm counting that as one. Okay, there we go. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, and that, yeah. If, if, if Kim heard it and you didn't, Ron, I'd want to know what uh, happened there, if you were napping or what. But, uh, yeah, I haven't either. You know, growing up in the church, I haven't heard one. And uh, so we're going to do a little eight-week series in Jonah. We're wrapping up Philippians. And uh, I think the, the idea this morning is looking at partners paying it forward. There are so many big problems in our world that are difficult, I think sometimes because there are so many people who become kind of roadblocks to positive change. There can be people who are like, it's a terminus with them. And, uh, and, it, and it just, like there's a positive change happening and then all of a sudden people are stopping it. Uh, and uh, it becomes so, so difficult to get over that. I think most really difficult problems that exist in our world have a group of people who are interested in not solving the problem. Uh, that as much progress as you make, they're, they're sabotaging it. Uh, this is one, one of the 180 businesses that were burned to the ground in, uh, in St. Paul. And uh, listening to some of the leaders uh, who block by block saw transformation and then have it all be destroyed in two days were just weeping. And uh, so you look at difficult problems, and some people are trying to, to build and, and, to, and to, to see a preferred future and walk into it, uh, and then others are, are more interested in seeing the problems perpetuate. It makes it really difficult. Uh, I'm reminded by one, one person I was talking about this in Africa, where, where the idea was to get rice to some starving people, uh, but, but then the rice just kept getting intercepted by warlords, how, who used it to finance the oppression of the people. And, and you're like, oh my goodness, we, we were sending the rice so that people wouldn't starve, and now we're actually uh, financing tyranny. That's not what we wanted to do. Uh, others, uh, you get lots of examples of this sort of thing, and, and they're unfortunately so common. And so a lot of the most difficult problems we face in life uh, seem to just not go away because there's a group of people wanting to do it. And then sooner or later, you just run out of energy. I don't know if you ever felt like this, where maybe you're out in the fields yesterday working late, and you're like, man, a nap sounds kind of good. Or maybe you're enjoying air conditioning appreciation day, and it's making you sleepy. And, uh, and sooner or later, you just run out of energy. Energy is, I think, one of the great commodities that just like a lot of young people have lots of energy, don't always know what to do with it exactly. And uh, it's hard to get channeled in the right direction. I think sooner or later, it's easy to get apathetic. I was struck by a quote from Eugene Peterson. Uh, a lot of times people know him uh, for the message, but he actually, I think, had a bigger impact in writing to pastors and missionaries. He wrote a number of books. This one's on Reflections on Jeremiah. And it's a little longer quote, but I hope you'll be able to stick with me. He's describing, I think, so much of what our culture is like. He says, the puzzle is why are so many people living so badly? Not so wickedly, just so inanely. Not so cruelly, but so stupidly. There's little to admire and less to imitate in people who are prominent in our culture. We have celebrities with very few saints. Famous entertainers amuse a nation of bored insomniacs. Infamous criminals act out the aggression of timid conformists. Petulant and spoiled athletes play games vicariously for lazy and apathetic spectators. People aimless and bored amuse themselves with trivia and trash. Never, and neither the adventure of goodness nor the pursuit of righteousness gets headlines. Modern man, said Tom Howard, is a bleak business. To our chagrin, we discover that this declaration of autonomy has been issued not in a race of masterly men, a bold new race, but we see it described by our poets and dramatists as bored, vexed, frantic, embittered and sniffling. Not a real powerful, not a real beautiful picture of our culture. I remember uh, one guy that had this friend from Africa 
and he wanted him to go see uh, an American sporting event, and so he brought him a football game, and, uh, and he watched it, and you know, I think he was struggling to, to know all the rules, and he asked him, kind of big picture, what did you think? And he says, it looked like 50,000 people who badly needed exercise watching 50 people who badly needed to rest. <laughs> Hmm, maybe not that far off, you know, and uh, that's sort of what he's getting at. And so as much as we're, we're saying, you know, that there's so many that are like, that are, that are living vicariously through other athletes while they sit on a couch and watch a game badly needing to get up and, and do something. And so I think what we find is that there's, there can be this apathy. One time someone asked Mr. President, what is the greatest the greatest enemy we face is in ignorance and, or apathy. And the response was, I don't know and I don't care. You know, so it's like, well, okay, I guess you get, you get both. You get a twofer on that one. You get ignorance and apathy. And so it's these difficult issues, but the Word of God has something more for us. This is the last sermon in this series. So if the, if the purpose hasn't happened yet, I'm just going to have to trust that seeds were planted. That will grow later. But the whole prayer and driving purpose through this whole series was that we would grow in our passion, in our purpose, and progress as full partners in the advance of the gospel. Here's the big idea this morning. That we would grow as partners by paying forward what we have received as individuals, as a church, and as a movement of churches. So this idea that we've been given much and we have the opportunity to therefore give much. So let's go ahead and go to God's word, his timeless truth. And we're going to be wrapping up, reading the end of this, uh, end of this uh, book. So I encourage you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, reading from 14 to the end, to the end of the chapter, to the end of the book. Yet it was kind of you to share my troubles. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of God, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you alone. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I would seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increased to your credit. I have received full payment and more, and I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Maybe some of you knew that verse. That's where it's found. And to our God and Father uh, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Even uh, greet the saints, every saint in Christ Jesus, the brothers, the spirit. So we close the book with that greeting. Okay, so... Let's look at what effective partnership looks like. First thing we notice is that effective partners are emotionally connected to those advancing the gospel. He says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And, uh, and you think, well, how did they do that? Well, they, they partnered financially. They gathered together and sent a gift. They not only just sent a gift, it wasn't Western Union or or, or uh, you know, sending uh, wiring money as we might do it today. In fact, actually, there are a lot of times in missions. Um, it's kind of scary how this works. A lot of missions still happens with somebody taking money on their person. I remember when I was an officer of a mission organization I served in, they had 50 missionaries in the country and a number of projects. Probably had maybe three or four million dollars running through that channel every year. And as an officer, one of the things I had to do was go to the bank and, and uh, receive payments and then, then bring them back to where the money was held secure. I remember one time the, the teller, they had this thing they did, you know, held up, I, at that point I think it was getting like $70,000 cash. Uh, and uh, they held the money up and fanned it out. And like everybody in the bank stopped and looked at that and, and uh, got out their cell phone making calls. And I, I had a really good prayer life on my way home from, from that bank, you know. Like, what is going to be waiting for me outside this bank? Who are those people calling? And uh, so a lot of missions still happens where you take money in, a lot of partnerships. I've had uh, cash that I brought in, and uh, it's still uh, a reliable way. Because a lot of places in the world, banks aren't all that reliable. I know several that said, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to go through banks, and, and they lost all the money. And so people still doing it this way. Taking money, Epaphroditus took a gift from the church, and then he went into prison. That's really hard. 
He went into prison to visit Paul. Uh, and sometimes when that happened, they're like, hey, why don't you just stay? You're visiting, let's make your stay permanent. Uh, if you want to come to jail, why don't you stay there? Uh, I know believers that actually that happened to them, where they went to go visit someone in prison and they just had that uh, made permanent. And so it's no small thing to go and visit him. And so he's saying, to share in my trouble, like how? Like go into jail and bring the gift. Uh, and they were emotionally invested in those that were advancing. As real partners are also born out of the connections, out of things that bother us. And I, and I think if most churches are really honest, they probably are not that emotionally invested in their partners. Like, I mean, it just how much sleep have you actually lost over, say, something that one of our missionaries is going for? I mean, where, where you just can't sleep at night because of what they're doing. I think from when I talk to missionaries, most of the time when they come back, that they're happy if, if, if people remember even remotely what country they're serving in. I, I remember as a missionary coming back where I, I had some churches where they never got it right. <laughs> after 10 years of ministry, I was like, I hope after 10 years of coming back and giving updates, they might get the country right that I'm serving in. And they never did. You know, and uh, you just think, how deep is that? Are you losing sleep? I know for a fact they were losing sleep. They, they couldn't, they had no idea what was going on. And this is quite the opposite. This is like so emotionally invested that they're bothered by that. Effective partners give sacrificially to advancing the gospel. This is talking about finances. And uh, I know so many are like, oh, we don't want to talk about that. I know oftentimes we have extremes. I've been there and I've heard it too. I've heard people abuse the gospel for financial gain. You know, that, that uh, God wants our church to have another jet and, you know, whatever. And, and, uh, and, and uh, God's going to give us that. And, and we just need to believe in him and, and the name it and claim it and the health and wealth and abusing the gospel for financial gain. That's, a, that's just completely irreprehensible. That being said, we, we oftentimes go to the other extreme. And think, uh, I remember a joke, some joke with churches that blessed are those who never talk about money for their always make budget, you know, and it's like, I, that actually isn't in the Sermon of the Mount, you know, it, and Jesus talked about this stuff, and I know for some, they're, they're just reticent to, to even talk about what Scripture talks about because they're so worried about the abuses on the other side of this, and uh, Jesus talks about money, he talks about giving, he says there's a treasure heart relationship, that what you're investing your treasure in reveals where your heart is, but your heart also grows, and so he encourages and thanks these Christians for financially engaging in the advancement of the gospel. And uh, it's so true that when you pour your heart into something, when you pour, make an investment into something, all of a sudden you care about it more. And I know for some that's why supporting missionaries ends up being something or sponsoring a child and then you start praying for her or lots of different ways this can be done. It says that you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, uh, when I left Macedonia, I think he's talking about when the gospel came into their, into their area, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you alone. He's pretty emphatic in that. He didn't have to say it twice, except for you and then only. Uh, even in Thessalonica, you sent help for me once and again. And so this is actually a rare kind of partnership. A lot of times uh, Christians might say, yeah, we're going to pray for you, yeah, we'll... But then there's another kind of partnership where you roll up your sleeves and you get engaged in it and what's needed and, and then you get after it and you do it. Effective ministers maintain financial transparency to protect all involved and the integrity of the gospel. Uh, I don't think this is talked about a lot, but this is exactly what's happening in this passage. So let's, I think this is a detail that's often missed. In fact, I've heard this preached before and it's almost never talked about. I'm not sure exactly why, because it's there. Let's look at it. So he says, I have received full payment. This is a, this is a financial term, like paid in full. Maybe some of you had things you stamped that on bills, paid in full uh, or whatever. But uh, he's like saying, I got all the money. Uh, and I think this is so important. Uh, I know there are financial systems in the church in place, and that's good, and that's the way it should be. When uh, I was sent by the church, in my last context, I, a number of times, was sent with financial resources. I would always have the partner that was receiving the money sign a statement that said, 
Pastor Devin gave me this amount of money on this date. I have received it. Why? Because, uh, well, lots of reasons. Why? I don't want the church or anyone thinking that, that maybe I took a cut out of it along the way. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted uh, that person to have financial transparency modeled to them. And we have here that Paul's doing this. So having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, and then he, and he says once and again. So he's naming Epaphroditus and saying, everything you gave to him, he faithfully brought to me and handed to me on both occasions. So this is financial transparency. Part of the reason Paul does this is for Epaphroditus' sake. Because how does the church know that he actually gave all the gifts? And he said, and he doesn't just leave it vague. He doesn't just say, Epaphroditus gave me stuff that you had for me. He, he, you know, he gives the number of gifts. Because then the church would know. You're like, okay, well, he gave the one gift, but what about the second gift? Did he keep that one? Uh, so Paul was very meticulous. If you dive into the grammar here, He's very specific and very meticulous to give an accounting uh, of all the money that went through this channel so that uh, everybody knows it's all about board. Everything's, everything's good here. Epaphroditus was a faithful servant who, who passed on all the resources that were given into his care. It wasn't his money, and he brought it and gave it to where it needs to be. I think it, it clearly teaches financial transparency. Effective partners believe God can and will bless their engagement in the gospel. And he says this on, on two parts. The second half of 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your account. And again in 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is a beautiful teaching. You are not going to outgive God. You know, I, I, sometimes I don't know what kind of God you uh, are relating to. For some, they look at God and he's, he's miserly, he's kind of, he's kind of stingy, you know, it's, you got to be careful, uh, and, yet, and yet God is, this is not health and well gospel, but, but God is saying that, that if you engage generously, financially, in the advance of the gospel, that, that Paul's like, don't worry, God's going to take care of you. That this, he's going to supply all of your needs. I think this comes down to a fundamental thing. That Paul, this is for Paul, this is something he wants for you and for me, not from us. And I know for so many Christians, that's a tough one to get over. When it comes to giving, it feels like this is something that you want from me, not for me. And uh, I think that feeling exists maybe because of just kind of inherent skepticism, maybe sometimes because of abuses in the past. But at the end of the day, this is how Paul ran it. In another church, Corinth, money was always an issue. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to take a single penny from you, ever. And, you know, and it's like, no, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to work. I'm going to borrow, even to steal from other churches. And he's not stealing money. He's just saying, this is money you should have given. But I'm not going to take a single penny from that church because your attitude towards money is a mess. And he didn't want to be indebted to them. And so, uh, but here we have this church has a beautiful attitude towards money. And, and Paul is praying for them. This is really a prayer of blessing. That, and, and my God, he believes this. It's like a promise. It's a, it's a future perfect. This will happen. It's like a done deal. God will supply your need. He will. He does. Don't worry. It's going to happen. We don't know when. We don't know how sometimes. But he's going to. Is going to happen. We are connected relationally to other Christians and to churches, from a church to church. You know, I think uh, it's kind of interesting to see how all the, the pendulum kind of swings. Uh, you know, and uh, one of the funny things about the free church is sometimes people don't know what we're free of. You know, <laughs> and uh, I've talked to so many people, they're like, I have no idea what free in there is. Like, is it evangelical free, like caffeine free, like no, no evangelicals in there, you know, or, or what are you free up, you know, and uh, sometimes people like it to be vague, you know, you're like, anything, you know, just kind of anything that you might want, because then we're free of, we're free of that too. We don't want to name it, because then 
because then we'd be just free of that. If we leave it unnamed, then, then we're going to be free of everything. Uh, you know, I think the whole movement, both not just for us and others as they left the, the continent, intrusion and having a state-imposed religion. It was the national religion where you couldn't leave a church because the government said there's only one church in Germany. It was the Lutheran church. And, uh, and there still is a national church there to its day. Uh, talking to my friends that minister there, they said it's just an uh, unbelievably deplorable condition. They say once in a while you can find a pastor who still believes in God, but it's a rare thing. Uh, and so that's what we left, and this is what we moved to. Sometimes, though, the pendulum has swung so far this way that we've lost uh, the other side of this balance, that, that we don't exist unto ourselves, that God's plan uh, was, was to build the church, and, and that wasn't just one specific church. Oftentimes we can get disconnected from other churches. I found in general in America, we have an overly uh, developed sense of the universal church and an underly developed sense of this interconnection piece. Now let's go, there's a survey, there's the passage, the whole thing pretty much. Let's dig deeper on a couple of issues because there's a couple of beautiful things I want you to see. That God desires us to be channels through which his blessings flow. And this includes finances. Uh, the dominant image of the church should be a river, not a lake. Because I want you to think about this. Uh, and in fact, most churches' scorecard, and we can talk about that next, uh, most of the church's scorecard is built around a lake. Now think about a lake. A lake, we have 10,000 of them, right? So, uh, you know, I, I think Olmstead County feels inferior because they're the only county that doesn't have a a natural lake. I mean, if you live in the land of 10,000 lakes, and they don't have a single one. It doesn't seem fair. Other counties have a lot more. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of lakes around here. Think about what a lake. A lake is is accumulated water. Uh, and uh, when you think about a river, uh, it's a different image. It's a channel. It, it's it's not. Now you can dam it up, uh, but but then it's not really a river anymore are not the way it was, that uh, the dominant image for what the church should be is, is it how much we accumulate? And for many churches, this is the scorecard. It's how much money do we accumulate? How many people do we accumulate? Uh, a lot of times people talk about, you know, uh, nickels and noses and, and what do you count? And how much uh, of it do you, is it about accumulation? Or is it how much moved through it? I haven't ever seen that with a river until I went hiking in Zion National Park and wanted to go on the Narrows. And they monitor very closely what the throughput of that river is. And they have a threshold. They know when it's safe to, to hike in the Narrows in a slot canyon. Uh, we were with uh, some folks showing us their picture of their peekaboo slot canyon. You do not want to be in a slot canyon when it rains. It's just bad news. <laughs> it's happened to people. They drown. That's what happens. Because uh, there's like nowhere for the water to go but up. Right? So at Zion, they keep it. They write it down on the whiteboard every day. And if it's more than 150 cubic feet per second, you don't go hiking in there. Period. And if it's less than that, you can. They're measuring how much water is flowing through that. It's not a, they're not measuring how much water is in the lake. How much have we accumulated? How much have we gathered together? How much is stagnant and not moving? It's how much is going through us. How much, how much is coming in and how much is, is coming out? I think for most churches, the dominant measures of success are around accumulating, not being a channel. And for many people, it's the same thing. What's your definition of success? Is it how much money you've given away in your life? Is it how freely you have been used by God to be a blessing to others? Or is it how much of that you've accumulated? For many people, the dominant image of success is to be a big, beautiful lake where water can come in and just can't get out. And many times what happens with that is it becomes unhealthy, becomes stagnant. It can become deadly. 
Maybe you may be that. Don't drink that water. Why? Because it's like a peachy dish. You know, and he's like, do you want to get sick? Now or in five minutes, you know? Uh, whereas, think about a mountain stream. Oh man, there's hardly any better water than that. Why? Because it's flowing, it's fresh, it's not stagnant, and uh, it's a dominant image. I encourage you to think about, how about you? What is flowing into your life in terms of blessing, and what is flowing out? God designed us to be rivers, not lakes. And uh, he designed us to be channels through which his blessing could flow. And uh, I think this is a radical reorientation. And I know for churches that have made this switch, that said we are going to define success with not what we accumulate, but what we give away. We are going to define success of how much of God's blessing we channel through us and give to others. When they've switched the scorecard, when they've switched the definition of success, they've had a radically different experience. And for the churches that I know that have done it, they would never go back because it's just so joyful to be the channel through which God uses to bless others. They can, we are called to be part of an interconnected group of interdependent churches. Denominations are funny. Some will say, you know what? You will never see the, the, the word denomination in scripture. And it's like, that's true. You don't. Now, to be fair, you don't see any English words in the Greek text. You know, there's. There's approximately zero English words in the Greek text. So, uh, you know, when you translate a Greek word, you're looking for the English equivalent. And so you know, I think you have to push a little bit past that. You, you never see that word because, of course, we never see a lot of words. Uh, that, you know, that, that's the thing. It's written in a language, and, and the words from other languages aren't, aren't in there. Uh, and uh, so do you see the idea? When you say, well, what we do see in the New Testament is groups of interconnected churches who have some level of autonomy but sacrifice some autonomy to be part of a larger movement. And we see groups of interconnected, interdependent churches in networks that we do see. And if that's what a denomination is, then that's what you see in the New Testament. This, I think, is something that's so fascinating and we're, we're uh, seeing this more and more. In fact, it's fascinating. There's a research project at Iowa State that was studying the early church as one of the first complex networks. Uh, and so you got secular researchers studying the early church because Paul did this. He built networks of interconnected churches. Uh, and, and he had these health churches. And then from there, they would go out in spokes. And so Antioch was one of these. And then later, Ephesus was one of these. Uh, maybe sometime we'll show it to you. There's a graph that we have now of all the churches that were planted out of Ephesus. And it's about 20 churches that were planted out of Ephesus. In fact, if you're familiar with Revelation, every letter that Jesus wrote in Revelation was to a church that was planted out of Ephesus. And, uh, and so what we see are these hubs and then spokes. And so there's, there's a, a strategic urban center usually, and then from there, there's multiplication, but this is indeed what God has done. And uh, what does that look like today? I think for, for many of us, this is kind of this untold story. So I wanna, I wanna tell you this, because I think this is so exciting. It's one of the great things that God has done and is doing. So I want you to get the story. So here's kind of the story, if you will, of multiplication in southeastern Minnesota from the evangelical free church's perspective. Now there are other groups that are doing this as well. Converge, which used to be BGC, uh, and uh, Baptist General Conference. Now, no one can remember that name. And uh, I know many in that tradition gnash their teeth with the name because it seems to have amnesia floating around it. But uh, they also are planting churches and uh, seeing things change. But here's kind of our story. Uh, church planting, I think, has changed the landscape of, of Christian churches in southeastern Minnesota. Sorry. There. Okay, I'm not in love with this. I couldn't quite get the map to do what I wanted it to do, so this is not the best, but it's, it's what I got. Uh, okay, so let me just tell you some of the, the story. Some of you know this, some of you have lived through this, but from Calvary and uh, Ephraim Church in Rochester, uh, first planted to Stewartville. They had, they had about 15, 20 folks, and they started to have a burden for their city. They're like, we're willing to drive from Stewartville. And maybe some of you know that's kind of, you know, a sort of a bedroom community. 
Uh, we'll drive from Stewartville to Rochester, but our neighbors aren't. We'll, need to. we'll do it. We'll drive. That's not a problem. We love that church, and we'll do it. We'll drive, but our neighbors aren't. So then they prayed and processed, and that 20 has now become 300. I, I, maybe I'll find it sometime. I did a data map of the ones that went, scattered around down there, and then the ones that are there now. Let me tell you one story that came out of that. Uh, there was a guy in Stewartville that ran Cold Stone. In fact, he was a franchise trainer for Cold Stone. And uh, he's a total pagan. He's like, I don't, I don't have any interest in God. And his neighbor uh, ended up going to Grace E. Free in Stewartville. And his neighbor just lovingly pestered him and kept inviting him. And uh, sooner or later, he has to say, okay, I'll go with you. And he starts going. He starts listening to the gospel. And he gives his life to Christ. And, uh, and, and then God he's, he's tugged on his heart. And so then he and his family go on a missions internship with uh, the E Free up in Montreal, where there's a network of church planters up there. And, uh, and they said, you know, he went up there to do video. He's really good at video. Uh, and, uh, and they said, you know what, though? Actually, what you do for a living with Cold Stone as franchise trainer, that's kind of what we need to help train church planters. So uh, he got an invitation to go up there and Grace Stewartville and Rochester E. Free and a bunch of others joined together in sending this guy up. Now he's up planting churches in Montreal. He was a total pagan, came to Christ, got a call to missions. And because somebody decided, instead of driving somewhere, I'm going to try to reach my neighbor. Okay, that's true. But then, now, uh, you have um, them planting out again. But then we sent um, uh, 40 or so to a church that was going to do things a little differently with uh, Pastor Doug Mathers. And uh, I think they're about 500 now. And, uh, and then we sent about 25 uh, have, have become uh, 100 in Byron. And, uh, and so we, and, and they're, they're now, this next August, they're going to get officially recognized as an E-Free church. I was just talking to the pastor there for Christ that were not driving to these other churches that were around. Now we see um, the same sort of thing going out. So now Sheffield, under Pastor Paul Langmaid's leadership, he formed 14 geographically based life groups, two of which turned into a church plant in Sheffield. I met with him this last week and got to see the little office. If you're driving through Sheffield, right on the main street, you can see See, they have an office front there at night. They have the cross lit up. And uh, they're uh, one year old right now. And they're already larger than us. They're at about 120. And uh, baby Hugh, he's growing quite well, if you know that old cartoon. And uh, it's a big baby. And uh, about 25 to 30 went out and already over 100 one year later. Pastor Ty Spence was called to plant in Wabasha. That was with Paul Langmey before this, and now there's a church thriving in Wabasha. And so a lot of the churches in the area exist because somebody had a vision to send, and what you see in every case is multiplication. 25, you know, become 100 in a year. You see 20 or 30, they become 500. You see, neighbors that were not going to drive up to Rochester come, come to Christ. It's the story of multiplication. Winona, E. Free, Pleasant Valley, uh, planted a church in Seattle. I know Rochester and others partnered with them in that church, right in the most secular area. No church. It was one of the least church areas in the country. They said, we want to go to the hardest soil we can possibly find. And they planted a church there. And so uh, you, you see this vision for multiplication. Uh, again, this week there's conversations that are starting. So uh, Pastor Ty Spence up in Plainview, uh, uh, in Chatfield, you have uh, Paul Langmaid, uh, the pastor uh, in the E Free Church in Houston, and uh, Pastor Ed is in the conversation. I am as well as uh, Byron, and we're all just kind of talking and praying and seeing what God would do. I, I know for Paul Langmaid says we already feel like God's calling together a church in Spring Valley that already the seeds there are, are, are growing. And in each of these, what do you see? You see new people coming to Christ in that neighborhood, and then usually in mom, 
that backfills in so that a year to a, a year later they're they're in the same or better position than when they than when they sent. And so you, you just see God's plan for multiplication. The same thing's happening around the world. Uh, there are there are uh, 28 movements of God where where you're seeing three generations of multiplication. There's one movement like this in America out of Redemption Hill where they can trace 2,400 churches back to one church. And there are 10 generations of multiplication. Churches that planted a church, that planted a church, that planted a church, and they're all about our size. It is a mega church. And the guy that had this vision at the beginning is his friends were all starting mega churches. And he said, you'll have 5,000. I want a quarter million. And uh, you'll tap out at five, but this movement will see a quarter million, and he's right. He's actually built a movement larger than the entire E-Free denomination in the last 25 years through God's vision for multiplication. And so uh, this is a reality. These aren't just ideas. And sometimes people don't know, where do churches come from? You just drive into town and there's a church. But a lot of times when you hear the story, it exists because someone had a vision for what God could do in those areas, and there is increase. So we are connected to something bigger than us. Let's apply this. Let's apply God's word to us. What does this have? I'm going to ask you to do a heart check. Here, we're talking about the whole thing, not just that last point. How emotionally engaged are you in the advance of the gospel? Give me a kind of one to ten. One being, eh, yawn, what's for lunch? And, and ten is like, I'm all in, like I'm losing sleep over this, and, and, and I... I'm chomping at the bit. It's hard to be patient. Where, where are you at? Emotionally, in the advance of the gospel. My prayer through the series was that your passion would grow and that, that you would care more about this. Uh, if, if the gospel is not moving forward in areas, does it bother you? Does it, does it give you a little bit of kind of holy discontent? Uh, if, if it's like that, I'm okay with that. Then it's going to stay that way. Uh, because no problem is going to change because everything's, everybody's okay with it. Uh, so I want to encourage you. Just do a heart check. Where are you at emotionally? If the gospel's moving forward is not moving forward, does, do you notice that there's a little bit of energy there? Like, I, I'd like to do something about that? Or is it kind of like, eh, whatever. Apathy, ignorance, whatever, greater problem. I don't know. I don't care. You know, it's either or both. Uh, you know, then it's time maybe to do a heart check and, because the heart of God is beating for this. How specifically uh, do you financially partner in the advance of the gospel and, and do the ways that you do actually work? I think that's a, that's a fruitful question. You know, it's one thing to make an investment. It's another thing to say, what's the return on investment? Maybe you feel like that's not spiritual. Uh, Jesus does quite a bit, actually. The parable of this, the talents and the steward and the vineyard it is one uh, that, that Jesus looks to a, a lot. As a church, I, I think we're doing great here. This is a great time to make a point, is when it's not a problem. Uh, we need to maintain financial accountability, and we should insist on that in all of the partners that we have, for their sake, for our sake, and for the gospel's sake. I'm so glad that in 20 years of ministry, I've never had a personal encounter with this. I do have friends that have, and it was so painful. Somebody was doing the finances, there wasn't appropriate oversight, a seed of temptation was planted in their heart. They embezzled money. It broke their heart. I've heard of somebody who had to stand up and confess the sin in front of the... So $50,000 from the church and, uh, and the damage that was done in the church, the lack of trust around money that lingered for over a decade, the damage in that person's life. Oh my goodness, the enemy made all kinds of hate with that. And uh, when I heard that story, I was like, I, I would like to avoid anything like that. So financial transparency. That's why I like to be kind of removed from some of that stuff. And, and if I do ever touch money, it's with lots of oversight and lots of stuff that Paul was doing where you can prove, nope, this is the money that went into the pipeline. This is the money that came out of it. Uh, and everything was above board. And it's for the sake of the gospel. Because those that don't believe say, I know why you're doing that. You're doing that for money. And uh, when it's not true, it's okay. But then you can prove that it's not true. Believe that God will bless you as you open up your life to bless others. I, 
There's this thing, and this is a fundamental thing. If you could grab anything, I would love for you to grab hold of this. There's a fundamental posture. Do you have your hands open with God or closed? Because sometimes we are the biggest bottleneck that when our hands are open, then God can, can pour things into us. Sometimes we can't receive what God's trying to give us because our hands are, are closed because we don't believe that he's able. And he, we don't really believe what Paul's praying, that may my God supply all of your riches in glory, that, that he's able to do this and he's willing to. God is great and he is good. He can and he will. This is not help and wealth gospel. This is seeking first the kingdom and then God's going to do the rest of it. Because he's a good God and he's not going to leave you hanging. And uh, you can believe him. You can trust him. And if you're scared to, you need to do some hard work around trusting God. Pay it forward at every level. Where would you be if someone didn't testify to the good news to you? Just think for a minute of all the people who have poured into you. All the way back, you know, who can tell those annoying little stories? I never when you were good. I, someone was with Kai is like, you know what, I'm doing this because I want to later be able to say, when you were little, I was, I was doing that. They wanted that right. You know, so they're like, I'm investing now because I want to be that annoying guy at your graduation. So it's like, hey, that's fair. You know, you're, you're investing. You should be able to give that, that thing. And then they roll their eyes. But, you know, it's part of what we do. Who's all poured into you? And just think about where would you be if they hadn't? Where would you be if all the people who had poured into you just didn't? If they got bored, if they got distracted, if they got apathetic, if they decided they were going to be a lake instead of being a river? Where would you be? As a church, where would we be? As a movement of churches, where would we be? Right now, the tail of the tape, and I can talk about this more on a different occasion, 300,000 churches in our country. 300,000. Of those 300,000, almost 60% are stagnant and declining. Okay? Of the 300,000 churches, 180,000 are stagnant and declining. A lot of reasons for that. A lot of reasons for that. About 30% about are growing largely on the back of that decline. There's only about 10% in our country that are growing through conversion, growing through people encountering Jesus. And, and that's what we want to have here. But, but it, it only happens when someone decides, I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give what I received. I've been blessed, so I want to be a blessing. God's loved me so much, so I want to be a conduit of love. I want to be a river, not a lake. And I want to I let my life be a channel through which God can distribute his amazing gifts. I've received his comfort, so I want to comfort others. I've been reconciled, so I want to be an agent of reconciliation. I once didn't have a people, but now I'm in the family of God, so I want to bring people into his family and invite them to family dinner. And it's, it's a shift of saying, I, I want to pay forward what I have received. I'm not going to be a dead end on God's blessing. I want to be a, a channel through which he blesses. Let's just imagine for just a moment what it would look like. Could you imagine what it would look like for an individual who, who has been a dead end their whole life? Where God's pouring in blessing, but it just stops with them. It's all about them. It just stops. And they just accumulate God's blessings. And they're like, God, I love your blessings. Just give me more. I want more and more of your blessings. But it breaks the heart of God. And could you imagine if they just repented of that, of that selfishness? And just said, Lord, I don't want to be a lake anymore. I want to be a raging river. I want to see your blessings flow through me. I want to pay it forward. Someone invested in me. Someone shared the gospel with me. I want to do that for someone else. Could you imagine what would happen? Could you imagine a group of bored, distracted, consumer Christians rise up out of that and decide to live on mission for Jesus Christ? Oh, what an amazing thing it would be. Could you imagine if Christians everywhere... My prayer for you is that you would grow in, this, in your passion, in your purpose, that you would make progress, that we would together as full partners in the gospel, that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Pray that you'd be like a great sprinkler, <laughs> just sprinkling that blessing 
on dry and parched land that desperately needs it. All right, let me just uh, close in prayer and we'll head up. Lord God, thank you so much for these people gathered and for, for those that were not able to be with us, Lord. We just thank you for your blessings that are ours and they are innumerable in Christ. We are so, so blessed, Lord. Help us to channel your blessing to those who desperately need it. I thank you for these dear people gathered, for how much they love you and love your church. In your name we pray, amen.